Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what planning it is carrying out regarding the additional powers proposed in the Scotland Bill. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to using these new powers to create a fairer and more prosperous country for everyone who lives here. We set our early policy priorities in the programme for government for 2015-16, which was published in September this year, and are committed to an open and consultative process in developing policies for the new powers in the Bill. The Government will not recommend that the Parliament approve the Bill until a fair fiscal framework has been agreed. Graham Day. Uh, thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary is aware, it is proposed that control over the winter fuel allowance will come to this Parliament. He will also be aware that down at Westminster, my MP colleague Mike Weir has sought over many years to secure early payment of this allowance to recipients who live off-grid in rural areas so that they can, for example, purchase fuel oil when it is cheaper to do so. Can I ask him if the Scottish Government will consider taking such a step to help ease the financial pressures on people such as he and I represent and alleviate rural fuel poverty? Cabinet Secretary. I am aware of uh, Mr Weir's efforts in this respect and obviously this is a point of detail about the operation of winter fuel allowance which the Government would be very happy to consider. We are taking forward an ongoing discussion through the Fairer Scotland process which has been presided over by the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Alec Neil, on how effective uh, winter fuel payment uh, can be at particular stages in the year to support um, individuals and we will of course consider carefully the suggestion that has been made in this question as part of the wider consultation on the implementation of the new powers under the Smith Commission. Thank you. Question number two, the name of Michael McMahon has not been lodged. The member has provided an explanation. Question number three, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will introduce the new peer-approved clinical system to replace the individual patient treatment request system. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Okay, a pilot of the peer-approved clinical system has already uh, been introduced. The initial outcomes from this pilot will inform further rollout. As the member will be aware, the revised individual patient treatment request system has provided substantially increased access ahead of a body of decisions from the Scottish Medicines Consortium under their new process. Anne McTaggart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her reply. However, I am led to believe that, President Officer, that this was promised for May 2015. And as the individual patient treatment request system has been extended, but with the new guidance to drop exceptionally, what monitoring has the Scottish Government done to ensure that the postcode lottery has been eliminated? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, we keep a very close eye on these matters and, indeed, uh, as we review the new SMC uh, process, uh, which, um, um, as I've said previously, we said we would do at the end of a year um, and we are doing uh, now, we ha will have an opportunity to look at all of these matters. But I think it, it's important just to, to note um, that the reformed individual patient treatment request system has seen some great improvements in patient access across Scotland ahead of the, uh, the body of decisions from SMC. Um, for example, in 2012-13, before any policy changes were made, around 50 patients in Scotland accessed orphan, ultra-orphan and end-of-life drugs through this route. But in 2014-15, the equivalent number was around 500. And that's why further changes have been carefully tested before uh, rollout. But I think it's in everyone's interest if patient access is facilitated through good quality submissions with a fair offering on price from the pharmaceutical industry to SMC. And as I said, the review of the new approach is providing a good opportunity to look at the impact of these changes. Thank you. Question number four. In the name of Ken McIntosh has not been lodged. The, min the member has explained uh, to me. Question number five, John Mason. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that the three Glasgow colleges each receive a fair share of the region's resources. Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance. President officer, it is for the Scottish Funding Council to assess regional needs and to determine the appropriate funding allocations for Glasgow and its three colleges, uh, consistent with the region's uh, jointly agreed curriculum plan. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, I, mean, I think there has been the concern expressed in some areas that because City of Glasgow has a new college, new, new building, and, or new buildings, and requires to fill them and draw in students to that college, 
that it could be detrimental to Clyde and Kelvin colleges. So I just would appreciate her assurance that Clyde and Kelvin colleges will receive the resources that they need. Side officer, the Glasgow curriculum plan, which all three Glasgow colleges signed up to, indicates uh, an overall 2.5% increase in provision uh, in community locations. Uh, therefore, I would expect uh, Glasgow Clyde and Kelvin colleges uh, would expect their funding allocations to reflect that and to be uh, sufficient to support this. It is also worth mentioning that Kelvin College uh, is building on its very successful uh, youth access uh, programme, uh, working with a, a wide range of community partners in college and community settings uh, to provide um, a, a range of courses uh, available to 12 to 19 year olds. Thank you. Question number six, Louise MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact of the closure of the Fourth Road Bridge is on communities in the North East. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Sorry, Minister Derek McCann. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The impact of the closure of this significant piece of national infrastructure has been felt across Scotland. The Scottish Government recognises this, and I give my assurance that we are using every resource available to minimise the duration of the closure and to get the bridge reopened at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we are working with our partners to minimise the impact of the closure, and I would again like to thank the travelling public, commuters and local communities for their continued patience whilst work to reopen the Fourth Road Bridge continues. Lewis MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. He will be aware that hauliers are facing extra costs of as much as £95 per vehicle per trip for runs between Aberdeen and Edinburgh and between North East Scotland and North East England. Given that those added costs are greater than the return they would expect to make on these runs, can the Minister tell us when the Scottish Government anticipates making decisions on compensation for hauliers facing such unforeseen losses? They have adapted very well to the bad news from the Fourth Bridge. Can they expect some good news for Christmas? Minister. Well, presiding officer, I think the first priority, and surely on this everyone would be agreed, that the priority has to be to get the bridge reopened as quickly as possible. That's the best possible mitigation for the current disruption by reopening the bridge. So all efforts are on that uh, at the moment. The Deputy First Minister has held talks uh, with businesses to hear their issues and their concerns. And during the period of closure, there has been the priority route as well for goods vehicles to support industry and business uh, at uh, this time. And there's been ongoing liaison uh, with the, the Haulage Association. In fact, I had the, the chair, or was it the chief executive of the Road Haulage Association, in the control room uh, at the bridge to talk about the, the issues of importance to them. So we'll continue to engage, monitor the situation, mitigate the impact, but remain totally focused in getting the fourth road bridge open as quickly as possible. Alex Rowley. Officer, and I would absolutely agree the first priority must be to get the bridge open and the confirmation of the, the 4th of January is where we're working to. But nevertheless, there are businesses in Fife and elsewhere who are um, feeling the, the, the difficulties, the financial burden as a result of this. So it's important, I think, the Minister indicates that we're going to be working with businesses to look at how they can be assisted over this period. Minister. Well, I thank Alec Rowley for his comment and also his praise of me in terms of the travel plan that's been delivered by Transport Scotland and our key partners. And of course, the amendments to our travel plan was actually welcomed by business organisations, showing that, that during the closure, this government is listening and responding to the pressures upon business. But the one major piece of action that everyone is calling for us to deliver is the reopening of the Fourth Road Bridge, and that is exactly what I am focused on and what this government and our agencies are focused on. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and always declaring an interest. What impact has the closure of the Fourth Bridge had on farmers and livestock haulage and delivery of animal feedstocks in the run-up to Christmas, and particularly bearing in mind the impact that flooding has had uh, on this area and, and been so affected the livestock industry in the North East and indeed the South as well. Minister. Well, John Scott raises a, a reasonable point. A number of sectors indeed have been affected because of the closure, but that's why we've been engaging with businesses 
Uh, and I think other interventions that have helped that I didn't mention earlier would also include uh, the relaxation of drivers' uh, hours as well. So every action possible has been taken to support a business. And of course, uh, a animal welfare was considered as part of the, the wide range of actions uh, as well. Now, as well as understanding the impact, and of course we will look at that, it remains our priority to get the bridge reopened as quickly as possible. And since there is such interest in the matter, I can report to the Chamber that the works on the Forth Road Bridge are very much on track. Cara Hilton. Um, thank you. The Minister will be aware that the closure of the A985 during the week is having a huge detrimental impact on small businesses in my constituency, such as the Walled Garden. And the result is that staff have been had to leave, uh, been laid off. Normally, they'd be expecting to serve 130 meals a day during the busy Christmas period. Last week, on Wednesday, they had just seven customers. On Thursday, 11, and on Friday, it was 18. And this has had a knock-on effect on suppliers too. I'm pleased that. Um, restrictions are being lifted from next Wednesday, but I ask the Minister once again, will you act now to remove the restrictions now on the A985 during peak, off, outside peak periods, and how will small businesses like the Wall Garden be compensated for their severe losses? Minister. Well, the matter of compensation is a wider point, but you see the question started off by Lewis MacDonald asking what extra prioritisation would be giving to the haulage industry. I outline what that is, and then Cara Hilton complains about the prioritisation for that industry in the A985. This government has taken the right interventions to support business, to support communities, to mitigate the impact during the necessary closure of the Forth Road Bridge. And I appreciate the impact that it's had on local communities, and that's why we've been engaging with Fife Council and local communities during uh, this period of disruption. And we'll continue to do that and remain focused on the objective to get the bridge reopened as quickly as possible, because that will give the greatest relief to those communities who have been affected uh, during the closure. Yeah. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I, for one, I welcome the way that the Minister has risen to this significant challenge. And there is obviously real challenges still to go on. But you know, when, this, when the closure is ongoing at the moment, Minister, it also provides some opportunity to do other work to, to the bridge. Could you give us an indication of what other things are currently going on while the, the bridge is currently closed? Minister. Well, I appreciate the, the praise from Bruce Crawford. Maybe that isn't as surprising by the praise that's been reaped upon me by Alec Rowley, who has praised my handling of the Travel Action Plan. I can confirm to the Chamber that we and our operating company have taken every opportunity during the period of closure to undertake further works and take advantage of this closure to bring forward and accelerate work that uh, would may be scheduled uh, later on. So we have undertaken a range of works uh, by taking advantage of the opportunity uh, of the closure. And surely that will be welcomed by members as being the right interventions and proactive. Question number seven, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to deal with delayed discharge in Edinburgh. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. The Scottish Government is working closely <coughs> with NHS Lothian and Edinburgh City Council to reduce the length of time people are waiting to be discharged from hospital. The partnership is finalising an action plan that will see a reduction in delays over the short to medium term. The latest census shows an 11 per cent reduction in delays over three days from the previous month. Jimmy D. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. She will be aware that delayed discharge has caused real distress to older people and their families in my constituency and across Edinburgh. Later today, I will meet with the Chief Executives of NHS Lothian and the City of Edinburgh Council to discuss what more can be done to address this issue. What more can the Scottish Government do to um, develop the range of services which will reduce hospital admissions and ensure timely discharge back to the community in order to fulfil her commitment, her clear commitment, to eradicate delayed discharge. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Edinburgh Partnership will uh, receive um, £8.19 million over three years from the £100 million pounds of delayed discharge funding that was, was announced. And of course, that funding goes towards developing a range of community-based services aimed at avoiding unnecessary hospital admission and, of course, ensuring timely discharge. Now, he will also be aware that uh, 
that yesterday the Deputy First Minister announced our intention to invest a further £250 million per year through health and social care partnerships, uh, which will make a, a real difference. But you know, I'm very clear that uh, there are some partnerships, including Edinburgh, that have a further distance to travel, and we are working very, very closely, and my officials particularly are working very, very closely with the Edinburgh Partnership to make sure that more rapid progress is made, and I can keep the member informed about that. Malcolm Tissom. Uh, Edinburgh has by far the highest uh, number of delayed discharges in Scotland, and some time ago asked for specific social care uh, funding to deal with its specific circumstances. But isn't it the case that the social care money announced yesterday, to which she referred, will disappear and be pale into insignificance beside the 7 per cent cut to local government funding, which is five and a half times the percentage cut to the budget overall. Isn't it the case that neither social care nor education will be protected in this unprecedented slaughter of local government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm a little disappointed at Malcolm Chisholm, who normally is uh, far more accurate uh, than he has just been. There is not a 7% reduction to local government uh, funding. And I can assure uh, Malcolm Chisholm that the £250 million that we have announced for social care, uh, we will ensure uh, delivers uh, additional benefit to uh, social care uh, uh, service recipients. It is very important that this very large injection of resource uh, gets to the places it needs to get to and delivers the change and the reform that the Deputy First Minister outlined uh, yesterday. That is real action from this government, focused on doing what we know needs to be done. And I would have thought Malcolm Chisholm, of all people, would have recognised and welcomed that. Question number eight, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to invest in flood defences for areas deemed to be at risk. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to investing in flood protection. Since 2008, we have provided funding of £42 million per year via the General Capital Grant to enable local authorities to invest in flood protection schemes. As the Member will be aware from what was announced yesterday in the settlement on the Scottish Budget Statement, on a like-for-like -like basis with the 2015-16 capital settlement, there has been a small cash increase in the 2016-17 capital settlement to local authorities, and that will be reflected in the amount of funding made available to local authorities to invest in flood protection work over the next few years. Alex Johnson. Uh, can I first thank the Minister for the confirmation yesterday that the £4 million Barnet element of uh, spending on flooding will be allocated to Scottish local authorities. But the other mention in the budget is the line that uh, the Government will begin to implement Scotland's first round of flood risk management plans and that fo focus work at local level to reduce uh, the level of flood risk. This, however, balances with a, a budget line uh, at the level three figures of 9.1 million, which is unchanged from last year. Does this reflect an adequate level of urgency? Minister. Well, can I say to the member that in terms of the, the announcement that was made yesterday, we are providing £3.94 million to those local authority areas most affected by the severe flooding that was caused by Storm Desmond in order to help them to support uh, flood-hit local households and businesses. Now, of that £3.94 million, Scottish Borders Council will receive £1.94 million uh, because it suffered the most severe impacts from the Storm Desmond. Perth and Kinross will receive £1.2 million in recognition of the impact both of Storm Desmond and the extensive scale of the significant damage that was suffered in Ailith early this year. Tafis and Galloway will receive uh, £700,000, with Stirling Council receiving £60,000 and South Lanarkshire Council at uh, £40,000 as well. And local authorities will be able to provide each flood-affected household or business with a grant of £1,500 to reimburse them for the opportunity cost of not receiving the full benefit of services they pay for through council tax business rates while absent from their homes or while businesses have their trading disrupted. Briefly, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome yesterday's budget announcement about flooding. And in order to particularly help my constituents in South Scotland, who are affected in Hoyt, Newcastle, and elsewhere, like Dumfries, could the Minister kindly explain 
uh, the timing of this, um, this money that will go to the local authorities, how it will be distributed and how it will relate to other monies that are already there so that there's a proper coordination of flood defences, including natural defences, for the future. Thank you. As briefly as you can, Minister. I can say to the member that in terms of Forsyth Lanarkshire Council, they will be receiving £40,000 and I'm very happy to send more details to the member in writing about that. Thank you, Minister. It's now 12 o'clock. We move to First Minister's question.